So my boring bad camera body doubles probably done a bit of an intro uh, so let's get into the actual information okay so the first idea the rabbis teach us that in the Hebrew language there is no word for coincidence right now why is it important for us to be able to grasp important because Hebrew is a language of creation right and therefore that teaches us that in the heart and mind of the great king the father coincidence doesn't exist Right, now, why is that interesting? Interesting because each and every one of us, wherever it is that you may be in the world, you are not here by some random sequence of events. Right? You're not here because of a Facebook ad or because of a friend or whatever the case may be. You are here because the master of the universe desired you to be here. Right? We believe this is a divine appointment. And I believe it's a very special divine appointment. Why? Because it's a very special message that the great king wants to share with you all. Right? Now, the unfortunate thing for you guys is that the Great King sent me to share the message with you. And I'm probably like uh, one of the most interesting looking men you've ever met um, in person or on camera. Right? So I just want to explain why it is that I look the way it is that I look, what our theological position actually is, so everybody can calm down that needs to calm down and we can get into the actual information. Right? As you said, that one of the greatest stumbling blocks to a great message is the messenger. I don't want this to happen at this particular point. Okay, so we identify as Israelite, right? We don't identify as Orthodox Jewish, Messianic Jewish, Hebrew roots, or Christian. And the reason why is that we identify as Israelite is because in here our father Abraham has a son Yitzhak, Yitzhak has a son Yaakov, Yaakov's name is changed to Israel. All over in the biblical text, it says, tell the Benai Israel, tell the sons of Israel this, that, whatever the case may be. In fact, in our scripture study, we found that almost the entire text is written to the Benai Israel, right? To the sons of Israel. And therefore, when we understood that, we said, this is the group of people we want to belong to, right? We want to be sons and daughters of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, right? Now, over and above that, we believe in the entire scripture from Genesis through to Revelations, right? We believe that the one who came 2,000 years ago that the world calls Jesus, we call him by his Hebrew name, Yeshua. We believe he is Mashiach. He is the Messiah, right? And by his blood and by his body, all who choose him as Adonai, as master, will be saved, right? So that's a decent enough uh, intro before we get into the actual information. And before we actually get there, we should have a quick prayer, okay? Let's have a quick prayer to acknowledge the king, right? There's be a method to the prayer, moment of silence just for me to try and connect to the master. I'm going to use some Hebrew words in this prayer, right? Not because I speak Hebrew, right? I'm trying to learn my master's language. And what do I mean by that? I'm, we believe that when the Messiah walked on this earth, that he spoke Hebrew, right? So I'm trying to learn my master's language. I'm not a Hebrew speaker. So if you hear some strange sounding words, I'm not praying to some other God, I'm praying to the God of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Okay? So a moment of silence, and we'll get into the actual prayer. Our fathers and praise them and thank you for the gift of Chai. And we thank you for the opportunity to Shema Hadaba Yoga, to hear the words of Yoga. Bevakashadun, I please my master, I ask that I do not deserve to sit here. I ask that may you speak through me to all who have come here seeking you today. Bevakashadun, I ask my master, please, that may we all live here today knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that there is no other dream, is no other God besides the God of Abraham. All this I ask in the mighty name of Jehovah, Elohim, our Yeshua. Amen. 
So how do we get involved in biblical oils and aromatics, right? So we've got seven kids. Yeah. Aiming for 12. I'm just kidding. All right, so we've got seven kids. And baby number three, Daniel Jr., one of my greatest blessings. We have him in a hospital in Pretoria in South Africa. And what a crazy experience, right? I don't know how long the actual whole experience takes, right? but the stitches, all sorts of crazy stuff. I leave there. I am traumatized, right? Now, after baby number three, hallelujah, our Father allows us to find the prophet Jeremiah. And this text is like one of the greatest texts that has affected how it is that we live our spiritual walk, right? It says, return to the ancient path and walk in it, for there you will find rest for your soul. So when baby number four comes along, we're like, yes, ancient path, right? We're going to do it as they did in the ancient days and have a baby in our home, a home birth, right? With a doula, midwife. So my beautiful wife engages with a couple of ladies and this one lady her soul kind of connects to. This lady teaches Salah to use two oils to manage pain. Wow. What an amazing experience. Poof, one and a half hours, baby out. <laughs> and whenever I say poof, baby out in one and a half hours, my wife looks at me and she says, it was poof for you. It was not poof for me. Right? But anyway, one and a half hours, poof, baby out. We are worship music, we are prayer. What a deep spiritual experience. Right? My wife becomes like a crazy lady after that. She's mixing oils, researching oils. Anyone who says hello to her, she's stuffing oils down people's throats. Right? And after a couple of months of this madness, I hear via the grapevine that some of my family in Zimbabwe say, your wife has become a Sanguma, right? the witch doctor. And I'm like, oh no, so it's not good to be married to a Sanguma. So hallelujah, our Father allows me to turn to the word. Is it true? Do anointed oils belong to Sangomas or are they part of a holy lifestyle? Lo and behold, the great king starts to show me some truly mind-blowing things. Right? He downloads an entire book on the subject into this empty head. Unfortunately, we can't share all the information with you guys today. I think we've got like 30 minutes or something like that. If you want to go deep into this truly life-changing teaching, visit ancientbiblicalhealing.com. Right? Anyway, today we've got 30 minutes. We're going to try and dive into the subject of why the gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, I believe one of the main reasons why we fail to access all the blessing that is sitting in the scripture is because we don't understand what the scripture actually is. Right? I think in the West we've kind of been taught that the scripture is a storybook with some good suggestions in it. However, it's a lot more than that. Right? The beginning letter of the Torah, especially the writings of Moses, for those who are not familiar with the word Torah, right? the writings of Moses, the beginning of the Torah is a bait. The last of the Torah is a Lamed. When you switch them around, they spell the Hebrew word Lev. Guess what Lev means? Heart. So why is that fascinating for us to understand? It's fascinating because, book of Judges, Samson's with Delilah. Delilah wants to know the source of his strength. Samson keeps on lying to her. When he eventually tells her the truth, guess how the Spirit records it? He tells her his heart. Imagine that. So from a biblical perspective, truth and heart are the same thing. Why is it important for us to understand? Because if this is a heart, the question is, whose heart is it? The heart of the Father. And why is it important for us to understand? Important because the scripture then goes on and says, guard your heart because out of your heart flow all the issues of life. And therefore, if everything, all of creation, all of life has come out of the Torah, the heart of the Father, it means all the answers to life's questions can be found in the Torah, right? A.K.A. the word the Messiah. He is the source of all of creation. Right? Now we believe that the written Torah and the living Torah, the Messiah, are the same thing. There is no conflict between the Messiah and the Torah. Right? They're the same thing. He or it is the blueprint of all of creation and therefore all of life's answers to every single question can be found in the Torah. However, you're not going to see these answers if you read the scripture in English or uh, any other translation. You have to read the scripture in the original Hebrew language and not just the language alone, the cultural context as well, right? So one of the first places our Father takes me to in this journey to defend my wife's honor, King Solomon, wisest man that ever lived, right? Proverbs 21 verse 20. Again, one of the reasons why we fail to access all the blessings in the Torah or in the scripture is that we don't understand what the scripture is. Right? From a human perspective, King Solomon, wisest man that ever lived. If there's any human being that should speak and we all should sit up and pay attention to every single word, this man, right? Wiser than Bill Gates, wiser than Richard Branson, 
fine. This is what it has to say. Proverbs 21 verse 20. There is treasure and oil in the house of the wise. Right? Now, why would he say that? The wisest man that ever lived. Treasure we all understand, right? A wise man should make some really good business investments and should have treasure in his home. But why would the wisest man that ever lived say, in a wise man's home you find oil? I mean, Abba Father showed me this text. I remember the day quite clearly. I was sitting uh, uh, around the pool, Somerset West, and my great desire to be a wise man. I right? walked into my kitchen, opened my cupboards. I had canola. <laughs> I was like, Abba Father, is it possible a wise man has canola in his home? And I doubt it. What did King Solomon understand that I didn't understand? Four or five years ago. Right? Next group of wise men, right? dealing specifically with the subject which is at hand. The wise men that come to the young Messiah. Now, we've all heard the story hundreds of thousands of times before, right? The wise men come to the young Messiah and they bring gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And the big fat question is, why those three things? Gold, we all understand, right? We're out there, we're working X amount of hours a day trying to get money. But why would these wise men bring frankincense and myrrh? What did they understand about these two things? Or maybe more correctly, what did they understand about the Messiah? Right? Now, why am I saying that? Our father Yaakov, right? famine in the land, he sends his sons down to Egypt to go and buy some food. But before they leave, he says something truly remarkable. He says, look into the land, take the choicest things that the land has to offer, the best of the best. Take it as a gift to the ruler. So the question becomes, why do you take gifts to a ruler? For what purpose? Now the answer is, favor. Right? In fact, the wages that gifts function, the law of gifts, if you are wise enough to discern someone's heart's desire and you deliver them that thing, you unlock untold amounts of favor. Now, we don't have to speculate whether these men that went to the young Messiah are wise or not. The scripture tells us they are wise men. And when these wise men go and visit the one they know, created everything on the planet, they ask themselves the question, out of all on the earth, what would the Messiah appreciate most as a gift? Guess what? This was the answer. Gold. Frankincense. Top three things to the heart of Messiah in all of creation. You know what the sad thing is? The sad thing is for most modern believers, after those three, guess what's the only thing we know? Gold. Right? In fact, my beautiful wise wife pointed this out to me a couple of months ago. In the ancient world, your actual money was silver and gold. Right? Today, the stuff we do all sorts of immoral things for is nothing but paper and numbers on the screen. Right? Now, we come from Zimbabwe. We can tell you it's nothing but paper and numbers on the screen. If you know what that means, go and Google uh, Zimbabwe's economic collapse. I think one of the most disastrous economic collapses ever recorded. Right? So I'm going to introduce you guys to frankincense and myrrh. Right? But before I do that, I need to explain a Hebrew word. Right? Now, forgive me, I'm not a Hebrew speaker, so I may be hacking the actual pronunciation. Kavana. Right? Kavana. What does Kavana actually mean? Right? It means to wield a weapon of skill, which means the intent of the heart. Right? Now, how does Kavana work? This man goes down to his local beach. Right? I can jump in the water and swim, come out of there refreshed, nothing special. Same man can go down the exact same beach, same body of water, and I can mikvah, which is the Hebrew word translated baptism, we get the word baptism from. Same man, same beach. First experience, nothing special. Second experience, supernatural. What changed? Kavana, right? the intent of the heart. Without Kavana, I can show you frankincense and myrrh, and you say, okay, whatever the case may be, funny looking uh, substance, pass it on. However, with Kavana, you can understand that these substances have been missing from the body of believers for almost 2,000 years. Right? I don't know how many billion people live on the planet exactly. I know it's well over 7 billion people. Guess what? The Messiah did not bring them here today to share with them top three things in his heart, in all of creation. He brought you. Now, if you can understand this, I right? do not hear by some random sequence of events. You are here because the Master desired you to be here. Then you will understand that this is a very, very special moment. This is a divine appointment. All right, so... The white one over here is frankincense and the reddish brown one over here is myrrh. 
right? So these are the two chief aromatics in our opinion, right? So what exactly are they? So frankincense and myrrh are tree resin, right? Um, tree resin, so it comes from trees, and these trees grow from the top of Kenya all the way up into the Middle East, right? So let's speak with regards to frankincense first. The whole world is going crazy about frankincense resin at this particular point. Right? People are calling it a miracle cure or substance. Right? And depending on who it is that you actually speak to, there's like maybe between 17 or 40 different frankincense trees. Their species name is Boswellia. Right? However, of the 17 or 40 different frankincense trees, only three could possibly be the biblical frankincense. And the reason being is that in Hebrew, the word for frankincense is levona, right? And a form of that word in the scripture means white. So out of the 17 or 40 different frankincense trees, only three of them have got white resin, right? All the other trees have got like a yellow color all the way through to black color resin. And true to form, the anointing, <laughs> true to form, the frankincense you can find in most healthcare stores, guess what color the resin is that it actually comes from, right? Dark brown, almost black color. And therefore, we understand that the frankincense that you find in most healthcare stores is evil. Stay away from that stuff, right? I'm just kidding. So we believe all the plants and the trees that our Father created on the third day are for Adam's health and his wellness. And however, we try to focus on the ones that could possibly be the biblical ones. Why do I say possibly be the biblical ones? Because I believe the only way that someone can actually say that this is the biblical frankincense is if they find... The actual incense that was used in the temple and do an actual analysis of that. Right? To my understanding, that hasn't happened. Right? However, I've had the pleasure of reading the work of an actual Cohen, right, a son of Aaron, who dedicated his life to understand what spices were used in the temple, and he believes it's the leading contender. This one is called Boswellia catari. Boswellia catari. Right? Now, the species name for myrrh, the biblical species, is Camphora myrrh. Right? Now, there is a myrrh species that grows in Namibia, southern Africa. However, I do not believe that that is the biblical species at this particular point. Right, so these are the two great aromatics of the scripture, the two chief spices. All right, so what do they actually mean? Right? From a biblical perspective, we believe that frankincense is feminine in its energy. Right? Now, why do we believe that it's feminine in its energy? Right? Because of gematria, right? numerology. Now, unfortunately, you say numerology to most modern believers and people lose their minds. Ah, Buddha, or whatever the case may be. Right? And it's a misunderstanding because you read the scripture in translation and right? also the cultural context. However, a lot of these people who lose their minds and say, ah, you say 666, and they're all like, I know what that is. Why? Because it's in here, right? And it shows us that the men who wrote the New Testament use gematria as part of their theology. Right? Gematria... No, numerology is an authentic ancient Israelite tradition of interpretation, right? So from the Hebrew language, you get understanding from each Hebrew word. Each letter is a pictograph. You get understanding from the pictures. Each letter has a numerical value, right? So this traditional ancient Israelite tradition of interpretation. One of the words in scripture for frankincense has it same numerical value of the Hebrew word ima. Guess what ima means? Mother. And there we see the link between frankincense and the feminine. And not only that, a form of the Hebrew word for frankincense, levona, is used in the scripture to mean moon. Right? And why is that fascinating? Fascinating because you know that women are connected to the moon via their cycles. Right? Now there's more to this idea of the feminine being connected to the moon from a biblical perspective. Now, our father, Yosef, he has dreams. He says, the sun, the moon, and the stars are bowing down to me. And our father, Yaakov, has interpretation. He says, oh, you mean me, the sun, your mother, the moon, and your brothers, the stars. And there we see the biblical link between the feminine and the moon. Right? Now what's fascinating as well, in the study, Gemara numerology, one of the Hebrew words for myrrh has the exact same numerical value as the Hebrew word for sun. Right? And as our father Yosef just showed us right now in this dream, our father Yaakov, in the interpretation of the dream, is that the sun is related to the masculine. Right? Now you may say this is all mumbo jumbo. However, you can find some ancient Egyptian artifacts. You'll find Egyptians walking around with like cone things on their heads. Guess what's in the cone thing? Hippophat and myrrh. And guess what they use it for? Sun block. 
Not only that, people who deal with aromatherapy will tell you that myrrh is an awesome sun block. Imagine, all those ideas are sitting in the Hebrew language, in the biblical text. We just don't see them, we see the scripture in translation. Okay, so what exactly did the gift mean that was given to the Messiah? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Right? So frankincense and myrrh represent Adam, mankind, aka the bride. And what does gold represent? Holiness and royalty. So what does the gift give to the Messiah? A bride, Adam, restored to holiness. Right? Now that makes perfect sense in our minds. Why? Because that's exactly who the Messiah came to get. A bride restored to holiness. Right? Now with that understanding of what the gifts give to the Messiah actually meant from a biblical perspective, I think maybe one of the most important things that we need to understand is why are people all over the world who are using these two chief biblical spices experiencing the amazing breakthroughs with regards to health and wellness that they are. Right? And we believe that the answer, once again, is sitting in the Word. Right? And just like the uh, writer in the New Testament says, everything's about the Messiah, it all comes down to the Messiah. Right? Now for this amazing understanding, we're going to go to the next body double. And he's going to unpack that for us. We believe that everything was created via the Word. Right? And therefore, if that is true, then we should find evidence inside of the Word as to why these two great aromatics do what it is that they do. Right? So we believe that for sure, frankincense and myrrh are the two great aromatics of the scripture, the two chief spices. And the reason why is that we believe that two, these two great aromatics do what it is that they do is because of the Messiah. Right? Now, what am I talking about? The scripture likens trees unto men. Right? It says that a righteous man is like a tree planted by the streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. Right? Messiah heals a blind man. He says, what do you see? The man says, I see men like trees. Okay? So we believe that frankincense is feminine in its energy, right? And myrrh is masculine in its energy. Right? Frankincense represents the lamb and myrrh represents the lion. Okay? Now we find it interesting when you go and look at the tabernacle, the Mishkan, right? We find that in the tabernacle there's two great trees, right? The first tree is uh, in Hebrew Shittim and I think it's translated as Acacia, right? Now this tree, you will find its wood, right? And its wood is its body, right? Its actual physical being is there, right? And its wood is overlaid with gold and silver and all sorts of precious metals, right? Gold, silver and copper. Right? Now, what does this mean? It means that there is a man, a tree, and this man is a man of honor. Right? However, the second great tree, in our opinion, in the Mishkan, in the tabernacle, this tree, you do not find any of its wood. Right? It has got a position of humility. The only thing it is that you find of this particular tree is its blood. And which tree is that? The frankincense tree. And where is it that this tree's blood goes, it goes onto the altar. And what's the altar all about? Atonement. And we believe that's where it is that healing actually comes from. Right? And this should bring to mind the ideas in Isaiah 53 that speaks about the servant, which we believe is the prophecy of the Mashiach. And it says, via this arm of Yehovah, right, the servant of Yehovah, that via his stripes we are healed. And we know that when the Messiah was beaten, those are the stripes which is that he received and he, ble he bled and that bleeding was for our healing. Right? Now we find it fascinating. These trees, frankincense and myrrh trees, grow from the top of Kenya all the way up into the Middle East. Right? These trees have been harvested by moon god worshippers for thousands of years. Right? Now these moon god worshippers, guess at which times of the year they harvest the trees. Right? They harvest the trees at two significant biblical times. First one, Pesach, right? Passover. And the second time it is that they harvest the trees is during the Feast of Sukkot, or Feast of Tabernacles. Two very significant spiritual appointed times. Right? And how is it that they harvest the trees is that they actually cut the trees and the trees bleed. Right? Now, what's fascinating about these appointed times is that these appointed times are likened unto the two aspects of Messiah. Right? The Pesach is all about the lamb and the blood right? and redemption, right? the festival of our freedom. 
which is one of the duties that Messiah has, one of the things that he has to carry out, right? The Lamb. Mashiach ben Yosef. Right? The other aspect of the Messiah we find in the festival of Sukkot, right? Tabernacles, where it is, it's all about the king, the ruler, the kingdom. Now we find it fascinating. In the beginning, we, we shared with you guys that we believe that frankincense and myrrh are feminine, masculine, and feminine, right? So what's interesting about that is that when we go into the beginning, right, that creation, Adam, mankind, has two aspects, male and female. And the interesting thing is, it is our belief that the feminine side needed a very different tikkun, which is like a, a, a restoration. And the masculine side also needed a very specific type of tikkun. Now, what do we mean, right? The feminine side, Chava, Eve, is the side of Adam which actually chooses to shema, chooses to hear and obey a different spiritual entity's voice over Yehovah's voice. Right? And our understanding, that's one of the uh, ideas that is put forth in idolatry, right? To follow a different spiritual entity, a different Elohim, a different God, a different God's words or ways over that of Yehovah, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Right? And because she chose to listen to a different spiritual entity's words, which is likened unto idolatry, there was a specific type of tikkun that was needed for the feminine side, right? which was the lamb that needed to actually come and die and make that restoration. Now, the masculine side of Adam didn't actually choose to listen to a different spiritual entity's voice. What is it that the masculine aspect of Adam did, in our opinion, is that he put down his authority. Right? Adam gave up his kingship. And we believe that that side of Adam, the masculine side of Adam, needs that tikkun, that restoration, with regards to restoring Adam's royalty and his kingship. See, two beautiful aspects of the Messiah playing out. Shalom, my name is Sarah. As a family, we have been using biblical aromatics for medicine uh, uh, for years, and it has been a phenomenal journey. I personally um, have recovered from anxiety, depression, infection, pain, um, in hindsight, over the last 15 years, I would say that I, a personal diagnosis would have been fibromyalgia and back then no one knew what that was and today it's very common. Um, along the journey we have seen people that have come and began to use the biblical aromatics um, and they instinctively no longer need insulin and no longer need high blood pressure medication and no longer need their hormone replacement. Um, therapies and it has been awesome to witness people have these encounters personal encounters um, the creator has left hundreds of aromatics for us in creation and when we looked at the biblical aromatics we narrowed it down to four aromatics which would be frankincense myrrh cinnamon and cedarwood in our opinion, every home should work towards having a pack like this, which is frankincense, myrrh, cinnamon, cedar wood in the oil format, a balm, myrrh resin and frankincense resin. With this pack, we can share with you hundreds of symptom protocols. We currently have a customer support group in Telegram, which you would join and you would be able to ask questions and there's many people that can speak from experience and then all of us as the support to give you um, advice on how to use the oils. We also experience people sharing their testimonies and it is a phenomenal support group. I'm always encouraged. However, if you're dealing with something, a condition that is chronic, what you would do is to book a consultation with me and I will put together a personalized protocol for you on how to use the oils and the resins and then provide the support after that. The oils and the aromatics um, you will soon discover after you do the teaching and after you begin to use them that they are tools in the hands of the Messiah. They 
go into the body and they optimize your trees, they optimize your lymphatic system, your cardiovascular system, your digestive tract, your endocrine system, and your central nervous system. And they cause these systems to speak to each other in shalom. And once that begins to happen, the body literally just boots out symptom after symptom after symptom, and you experience immediate relief and begin, you begin to um, experience long-term conditions that are resolved. So thank you for joining us and um, we look forward to speaking to you and meeting um, with you in the future and um, blessings for the rest of your um, day. Mm -hmm.